just to set the stage for our moderator. The region in 2006, the year Ambassador Michel Duclos arrived in Damascus to begin his assignment as France's ambassador to Syria, was transfixed by the catastrophic scenes of sectarian fighting in Iraq. 2006 was the year that brought us the bombing of the great Shia Mosque, al Askari Mosque in Samarra, itself an act that spawned an explosion of reprisals against Iraq's Sunni communities. It was a year of spiraling bloodletting that convulsed Baghdad, with the body count sometimes surpassing 1,000 killed in the capital alone in a month. And the flood tide of foreign fighters that helped po populate the battlefield in Iraq in no small part flowed there with the active facilitation of Bashar al-Assad's regime. And next door in Syria, a five-year-long drought was just beginning that some analysts would later argue lay the groundwork for the boiling up a protest in Dara in March 2011, grinding economic despair, finding its voice at a critical moment for the region. Or was it simply the wider Arab Spring that posed an irresistible magnetic pull to the streets of Syria, even against the bloody odds that a generation of Syrians schooled on the experience of Hama in 1982 knew only too well? Eight years on from those first still faded protests, Bashar al-Assad has seemingly decisively prevailed, thanks to critical support provided by Iran, the foreign ground troops it mustered to the battlefield, and above all, Russian air power and support. The Syrian opposition, fielded and supported since 2011 by a host of foreign backers, has largely been extinguished, Idlib being the last major holdout. But Syria in 2019 presents an astonishingly complex geopolitical chessboard on which the militaries of five foreign powers and at least one significant non-state actor coexist and occasionally confront one another. On June 24th, 26, we will, to the 26th, we will see an unprecedented trilateral meeting of U.S., Russian, and Israeli national security advisors, ostensibly to discuss regional security issues. But the main dish on the menu is Iran's presence in Syria. John Bolton, Nikolai Patrushev, and Meyer Ben Shabbat will meet as a result of a proposal first made by Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu during his February meeting with Vladimir Putin. Suffice to say, the national security agendas of the three countries are not wholly aligned on Syria, and between at least two of the three parties, it is difficult to see any commonality of view or interests on Iran. With us today to explore these and other absorbing aspects of Assad's Syria, past and future, are three distinguished experts. Our, our own Hanin Radar will moderate a discussion between her two panelists, Ambassador Michel Duclos and Ambassador Robert Ford. Ambassador Michel Duclos is a non-resident senior fellow at the Rafi Hariri Center for the Middle East, focused on Syria and the Levant. He began his diplomatic career at the policy planning staff of the Quai d'Orsay, where he served as deputy director from 1984 to 87. Always a man in the right place at critical times, Ambassador Duclos served as counselor at the French Embassy in Moscow and then in Bonn during the advent of perestro perestroika and the unification of Germany. Deputy Perm Rep of France for the UN, to the UN from 2002 to 2006 during the conflict over and in Iraq. He served as French ambassador to Syria from 2006 to 2009. He subsequently served as diplomatic counselor in the cabinet of the Ministry of, the, of Interior from 2009 to 12 and as ambassador of France to Switzerland from 2012 to 14. Ambassador Duclos has written extensively on international issues. His book, La Longue Nuit Syrienne, has just been published in France. In February 2016, he assumed the leadership of the International Diplomatic Academy as Director General, where he focuses on governance issues, economic diplomacy, and mediation as a means towards conflict resolution. He also serves as a senior advisor for Institut Montaigne, a French think tank focused on improving economic competitiveness and social cohesion. A renowned diplomat and Middle East hand known to all in this room, who really needs no introduction, Ambassador Robert Ford, who is, I hope, beaming in from Maine. Yes. Is he there? 
Okay, well, he will be imminently. Great. <laughs> Ambassador Robert Ford is currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington, where he writes about developments in the Levant and North Africa. Ambassador Ford retired from the U.S. Foreign Service in 2014 after an exceptionally distinguished career, capped by serving as the U.S. Ambassador to Syria from 2011 to 2014. As such, Ambassador Ford was a State Department lead on Syria, proposing and implementing policy and developing common strategies with European and Middle Eastern allies to try to resolve the Syria conflict. He served at two critical junctures in Iraq, as political counselor from 2004 until 2006, during the tumultuous establishment of the new permanent Iraqi government, and as deputy chief of mission from 2008 to 10. U.S. Ambassador to Algeria from 2006 till until 2008, Ambassador Ford received the Secretary's Service Award, the U.S. State Department's highest honor in 2014. And our moderator today, Hanin Radar, is the inaugural Friedman Visiting Fellow at the Washington Institute's Geduld Program on Arab Politics, where she focuses on Shia politics throughout the Levant. The longtime managing editor of Lebanon's Now News website, Radar covered myriad critical issues, including the evolution of Hezbollah inside Lebanon's fractured political system to Iran's growing influence throughout the Middle East. In addition to writing for many of the Middle East premier publication, Hanin has also contributed to a range of major U.S. publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, New York Times, and Foreign Policy. And without further ado, Hanin. Uh, where does, uh, how does Assad look today? How did he de get there? Um, is the regime regaining power? Is it losing? Can it survive without Russia and Iran and Syria? Can Assad take the rest of Syria? Is he going to take the 30% that he doesn't uh, control? Where is Idlib going today? How are we expecting Idlib to uh, develop? And does it really matter, actually, for the Assad regime or for his allies in Syria to actually take the 30% that, that are left? Is this a priority or not? And where are we going from here? There are many issues regarding the Assad regime, Syria, uh, in light of the Idlib, uh, ongoing Idlib battle, in, line of, uh, in light of the upcoming meeting between Russia, the US, uh, and Israel. Uh, we need to uh, look at the Assad regime today and see who actually does have the leverage over the Assad regime today. If we're expecting anything from the Assad regime today, who has the leverage and who can actually push Assad to do what he has to do. To shed light on all these issues, uh, I welcome Ambassador Duclos and Ambassador Ford. And uh, Ambassador Duclos, the floor is yours. And as we said, that we are going to take a break to eat before the next speaker. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Hanin. I'm sub I, I, I'm, am I supposed to answer all your questions uh, right now? No. Or I'm just mm -hmm. saying. Uh, uh, I can maybe in the first uh, instance uh, put the landscape. and. Uh, Please do. And <coughs> maybe as a starting point, I, I will uh, a little bit uh, uh, tell you what was my, my experience in, in Damascus. Uh, because if you uh, want to reflect on the, on the current issues, it seems to me very important that you have the right uh, diagnosis on the root causes of the uh, current uh, conflict. And of course, it's a very complex situation. Everybody said that before me. But in a way, it can be summed up to two uh, major uh, factors. The, 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 the first uh, factor is precisely uh, the nature of the uh, Assad's regime. And um <coughs> The, the, the strange uh, thing uh, about uh, this regime is that it never changes uh, its fundamentals and in the same time he is able to adjust uh, 
uh, to uh, new events or new circumstances. Uh, it was already the case in 2006 when I uh, came to Damascus, where you could find all the fundamentals of the traditional uh, um, Syrian system, uh, that is to say uh, a sectarian power, uh, a minority power, uh, resorting only to violence, uh, ready to do uh, everything uh, to stay in power. And then I'm a bit surprised when I see, uh, when I uh, read a piece in the New Yorker by um, Rob Mallet and uh, Senaga, uh, saying uh, one should not exaggerate the uh, sectarian dimension because the regime included uh, many Sunni personalities and so on. Yes, of course, that's true. In, in the daily life, uh, the face of the regime was mainly Sunni, in fact. Uh, the people the ambassadors used to meet were very often uh, Sunni, but the real power uh, was uh, firmly in the hands, not only of the Alawi uh, community, but of the Assad family. It, it, was, it used to be a very family-driven uh, country with a big difference between um, family members, the president, his brother, his son-in-law, and the important officials around them, but who remain only officials, not real decision uh, makers. Um, having said that, uh, the fundamentals were there, but the system was a bit different. According to the book, it used to be a bassist regime with a large uh, part played by the military and also with uh, a kind of strategic equilibrium between the Russians, the, the Iranians, the Americans, and by the way, the Israelis. With uh, um, Bashar himself, I think that those things have uh, changed. Uh, in my time, if I may say so, you didn't see any more the military since their withdrawal from, uh, from Lebanon. It doesn't mean that they didn't exist, they were not important and so on, but they were not anymore at the forefront of the regime. The Ba'ath uh, party has almost completely vanished. And uh, those were really the, the two pillars of the system were the Murabarat and the crony capitalist. And you know, the, in a way, the, 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 the added value of uh, Bashar himself was to give much more emphasis of this uh, crony uh, capitalism and on the Moabarat versus the military. Plus, another added value, if I may say so, which was the importance taken by Hezbollah and Iran. And there, you know, uh, all the Syrians you could meet would tell you, um, at the time of the father, uh, we had an alliance with Iran but we were not dependent upon Iran. And this is the thing we started to change fundamentally in 2000 when uh, Bashar came to power for a lot of reasons, uh, probably because himself as a person, he had a kind of uh, love affair with, uh, with uh, Nasrallah uh, at the end of the 90s that kind of personal chemistry, which of course didn't exist uh, with uh, Assad Faza. Then you had the um, uh, Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon, uh, the Iraqi war, um, a number of factors who make uh, Assad uh, more and more close, uh, uh, closer and closer uh, to the Iranian apparatus plus the uh, Hezbollah. 
And I think Iraq has been key, and you were both of, uh, of you uh, uh, right to, to stress that, because there he took a fundamental decision, which I think his father would not, would not have taken, which was to support the uprising in, in Iraq against the uh, American occupation. And that was extremely uh, important for him, because probably that was a way to uh, reaffirm uh, his authority toward his people, or the Moabites. But also, it was a way uh, for him to uh, go very far from any kind of uh, alliance with the Western world and becoming completely into the hands of the Iranians. That was aggravated, of course, after the assassination of uh, uh, Rafiq Hariri and obviously with the current uh, situation. Maybe a last word on uh, what I saw in, uh, in Damascus. Um, I was very much uh, uh, struck by a kind of deranged uh, assessment of their legitimacy. Because on one hand, uh, those uh, Assad people they believe that uh, they own the, the country, I mean, the, the, the country belongs to them. Uh, and they consider their fellow countrymen as, as serfs. I mean, all the Syrian people you could meet uh, would tell you that. You know. uh, and in the same time, they have a f deep feeling of uh, illegitimacy, lack of legitimacy. Uh, because they are convinced that the Sunni majority will never accept their rule. Um, I arrived at the time of the uh, Iraq uh, worst moment, and when I met with people in the countryside, in small uh, towns, uh, small shops, and so on, of course, uh, you don't you can't completely trust what people are telling to a foreign ambassador, but ultimately you can, at the end, understand one or two things. And one of the thing, one of the things which was uh, very striking for me was this idea that if democracy means the chaotic situation which is happening in Iraq, we prefer our dictatorship. And young Bashar is better than his father, he has a sunny wife, things like that. Ultimately, the public opinion, if I may say so, was not enthusiastic about the, uh, the, the Alawi power or, or the Assad family, but they had the feeling that they could live with, with them. You know, that uh, they were not in the mood of uh, challenging the, the regime. And when myself, I came a bit close to the high officials and, uh, and people uh, around uh, Assad, I dared to tell them, but you know, I can't pretend I understand your people, but what I, uh, what I can say, what I, I, I discern, is that they're not against uh, your president. Your president is more legitimate than you believe, so you could stop uh, arresting people, uh, torturing people, and things like that. And the answer was, Ambassador, you don't know them. You don't know history. And by history, they meant uh, um, Hamas, of course. And so that gives you uh, an indication of about the very profound uh, distrust that existed between the ruling elites and, uh, and the people. And uh, once again, uh, distortion in the real, in fact, uh, relationship between the, 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 the people and the, and the government. Um, I said it's very important to have the, the right diagnosis because now, uh, at least in Europe, 
uh, there are talks about uh, reconstruction and things like that, and uh, reconnecting with uh, with the regime for the for the good of the uh, of the of the people, of course. And I find it extremely difficult to to deal with a regime which is based on chronic uh, 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 capitalism and uh, intelligent surfaces. And once again, it's the essence of the regime plus uh, the support and the intrication with the Iranian system. I said two factors, but maybe now you are a bit uh, tired uh, of uh, listening to me. So I would just mention that the, the other uh, key uh, um, feature to explain the, the uh, Syrian tragedy is the uh, international context, of course, the Arab Spring, but also uh, what I call the asymmetry between external uh, interventions. And here again, it's very complicated, but basically, you had uh, the Russians and the Iranians giving full support to the regime. And you had the uh, Western world and their allies being uh, very restrained in supporting uh, the opposition. And that was, of course, uh, more emblematic at the time of the chemical uh, attack of uh, uh, 2013, and uh, in France, there is a tendency to put all the blame on Obama and so on. One should not exaggerate, of course, but it's, it remains uh, true that it was a defining moment where the regime understood that there was no limit to what he could do, and the Russians understood, and the Iranians understood, that the, the, the Western world was weak. Is as simple as that. And I must say, it's very important, I, I, I make the point in, in my book, uh, to uh, keep in mind the connection between the Hezbollah intervention at the beginning of uh, 2013 and the uh, American non-intervention uh, in the summer. Because at that time, I will not pretend that there was no Islamist uh, current uh, in the armed opposition. Of course, the Islamists were already there. But it was not the majority. The majority of the armed opposition was still secular, or let's say, I don't like very much the uh, word secular, let's say national. I don't like also the expression moderate, because when you take the arms, uh, you are not really moderate anymore. But they were, there, there used to be uh, a huge uh, uh, national mainstream in the uh, Syrian uprising. Uh, Kusser, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this uh, uh, fatal year, was the first time Hezbollah uh, went on the ground in a very visible manner. They were there before, of course, but this time they took the job of the uh, Syrian army. And the people in the opposition, in the armed group, for the first time they understood maybe after all it's true, it's not about the, uh, the political freedom or the opposition against the regime, it's about uh, the Shia against the Sunni. And there, the jihadists were in a position to say, you look, we have a point. And then, when they realized that the West uh, would do nothing, that is to say, in their mindset, would side with the regime. That's the way it was perceived. Uh, the conclusion they drew was, basically, the jihadists are right. We can't uh, expect anything from the West. We have to rely on God, uh, Islam, things like that, jihad. And so it's not only that uh, the West didn't not intervene, it's also, if I may say, we didn't intervene at the wrong possible moment, giving uh, de facto uh, 
an impulse to uh, the jihadist uh, rise. I'm very sorry I have been too long. Sorry also for my broken English. I hope you understood uh, something of what I was trying to say. Thank you. This is it was very, very interesting. So no, uh, it's, a, uh, it's very informative. And I'm sure I will, will come back to a lot of these details during the Q&A. Uh, since the food is still on the way, I'm really sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, we are going to continue uh, with the next speaker and then maybe take a break before the Q&A. <coughs> uh, <we're laughs> they're supposed to be here any minute. So um, Ambassador Ford, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, honey, and I hope you can hear me. We can, yes. Can you? Terrific. Uh, so first, let me thank you for um, inviting me, and it's an honor to be uh, on a panel with you and with Ambassador Duclos. I read quite a bit about Ambassador Duclos in uh, Sam Dogger's book uh, that just came out about Assad or we burn the country. Um, recognizing that your food may arrive shortly, I don't want to talk here. for a very long time. It's there. Yeah, but go on, go on. It's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Ready? So um, I learned a long time ago: don't speak um, in such a way that you prevent people from eating. So just a couple of key points. Um, first, um, how did we get here? Um, there is a real effort, I think, on the part of some uh, historians and politicians and uh, activists to rewrite the history of 2011. Um, but I was on the ground, and my team was on the ground, and other diplomatic teams, including that of uh, uh, France, uh, was on the ground. And the protest movement, when it started, was, by and large, uh, peaceful. There were occasional acts of violence, but I don't remember any uh, regime person being killed in Dara uh, during the first week of protest. There were some buildings burned, um, but by and large, it was peaceful. And it was that way in Homs, and it was that way in the Damascus suburbs. Um, and the reason that the violence took off as 2011 progressed uh, was that the Syrian government, the regime, was using violence in a very uh, indiscriminate manner, both indiscriminate and targeted. Uh, they were arresting a lot of people. Uh, and the reason for that was that the protests were initially demanding accountability. Um, Ambassador Duplo spoke about the Mohabarat, and that is what drove people into the streets, um, the behavior of the uh, intelligence services, the secret police in Dara, in other places. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that in March and April, and even into May, uh, no one was asking for Assad's removal. It was not the same as Egypt. It was not the same as Tunisia not the same as Yemen. Uh, but as the violence continued, then those demands changed. And from the beginning, uh, the Assad government rejected and still rejects accountability, uh, and it rejects power sharing. And I think that has always been the crux of the contest and the crux of the fighting. Uh, going forward, um, I think the uh, remarks that Assad gave in 2017 about a more homogenous uh, society that uh, may be in some ways smaller than Syria of 2010, I think that was extremely illuminating. Uh, it's very clear that uh, he does not welcome the return of uh, lots of the Syrian refugees. They view, the state views them as uh, enemies or potential enemies. They are uh, expropriating land uh, in neighborhoods dominated by the opposition, particularly in the Damascus suburbs. Uh, and Ambassador Duclos mentioned crony capitalism. I think Syria is a, is a model case of that, and that hasn't changed. Some of the faces have changed. We have faces now in 2019 that we didn't see in 2011 or even 2012, uh, but the relationship between this uh, business class and the Syrian government hasn't changed in terms of preferences given to business people in return for uh, funds, in return for loyalty. In the case of the civil war, it's even been mobilizing militias 
in some instances. Um, also going forward, uh, for sure the Syrian state is weaker. Um, I would in particular recommend to people in your audience who have not a report done uh, by a, a scholar named Nicholas Grinstead who wrote for the Middle East Institute a paper just a couple of weeks ago about how the Assad government's manpower shortage has enhanced uh, the local sway of some pro-regime militias up on the coast in a very sensitive area of Latakia and Kordaha, and how uh, Assad has had to rely on Russian military police in some instances to improve security in a uh, really a, a bastion of government support. Um, things like that we never saw in 2011, 2012, even 2013, I don't recall such a thing. Of course, the Russians didn't have a big presence in 2013 even. Um, so on the one hand, uh, rejection of power sharing, uh, tight relations between this crony capitalist class and the Syrian government, a uh, big role for Russia. And uh, the last thing I should mention is uh, continued dependence on the, uh, the secret police, the security system, the four agencies of uh, the Mahabharat services. Um, I haven't mentioned Iran, and so let me go to that real quick and then release people for lunch. Uh, so there is this discussion that will happen at the end of the month between the Russians, the Israelis, and the Americans. And I think all three governments share a desire that Iran not predominate in Syria. But I think it's really important uh, to look at the Russians carefully. Um, as long as I've been working on Syria, I have heard American voices hoping that in the end, Russia will deliver either Assad or deliver Iran, or deliver both. The Russian objective in Syria, above everything else, is for the Syrian state to survive. I want to underline that, for the Syrian state to survive. I don't even think they are particularly fond of Bashar al-Assad, but they view him as essential to the stability of the Syrian state. So when we think about Russia and Iran, for sure there's a contest uh, between them in Syria for influence, there's no doubt. But the Russians don't want to push that competition to the point where it would destabilize the Syrian state. So that is the message they've also passed to Israel with the, the airstrikes and the deconfliction mechanisms, which Moscow and uh, Jerusalem have worked out. Uh, it's okay to hit the Iranians, but you can't hit them so hard or you can't hit the Syrian state so hard as, as to destabilize the Syrian state. Thus, when the Americans and the Israelis get ready to engage the Russians about how to limit Iran's influence in Syria, uh, there will be limits on how far the Russians are willing to go. And I should add to that that the Russians will look at this as a question of Washington and Jerusalem pushing them to exacerbate friction between Russia and Iran. The, the Americans and the Israelis are asking the Russians to carry some heavy water. What do the Russians get in return from Israel and the United States? Um, Vladimir Putin is many things, but I don't think um, benevolent would be one of the words that we would use to describe him. So he will be looking for quid pro quos, whether that be in terms of actions uh, from the United States and or European unions with regards to sanctions or um, other things that are of particular concern to the Russians. And not clear that the American government has made up in its mind what it is prepared to offer Russia in return for greater Russian pressure on Iran. Uh, in the meantime, the Russians will continue to try to rebuild the Syrian Arab army. Uh, that's gradual, and it's it's what it's a step where the Russians, <clears throat> sorry, uh, move forward gradually, and they don't expend uh, huge amounts of resources month to month, year to year. Putin has been very careful about that, and so um, I wouldn't look for any big breakthroughs 
in this discussion uh, between uh, Russia, the United States and Israel about Syria and about Iran. Um, I think probably the best we could hope for out of it is um, a, a better understanding um, and in particular between the Israelis and the Russians after um, the deconfliction between air forces ran into some choppy water some months back. And then um, thinking longer term, the Trump administration itself is going to have to determine its priorities with respect to Russia and Syria and whether or not it is prepared um, to make some concessions to Russia on issues perhaps outside of Syria uh, in return for greater Russian help inside Syria. I think the Russians have leverage, um, as do the Iranians, uh, but what is in it for the Russians? And I have not yet heard that articulated very clearly um, out of Washington. I'm going to stop there. All right, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, to the speakers. Uh, let them s uh, answer and then open the floor for your questions. Um, let me start with uh, Ambassador Duclos. You talked a lot about the past of the regime, how it got here, uh, the main factors that shaped the behavior of the Assad regime in the past and during the beginning of the revolution or the war. Um, from your understanding, which apparently is very rich and deep, from this understanding of the Assad regime, how do you see him moving forward? Like if we're, we're going to deal with Assad today, how does he see uh, Idlib today? How does he see himself in Syria today? D does he see himself powerful enough to um, have the leverage to to make the decisions today? Is he the one making the decisions today? So let's talk more about the present and the future. Also, the second question, uh, I know that Ambassador Ford touched on that, and you did publish an article yesterday about the Russian role in Syria. And uh, as Ambassador Ford mentioned, the, the, what, what do you think the relation between uh, Russia and Iran in Syria? Is this a real alliance? What is the, the relation between both of them and the Assad regime? How is, do you see the Assad regime relying more on Russia or on Iran? How do you see this like trio dynamics working in Syria uh, today and moving forward? To Ambassador Ford, um, you mentioned Assad's uh, comments of 2017 about a small, more smaller and marginalized society. What does that mean to the people in Idlib today or the Kurds? Do you see some kind of reconciliation uh, between the Assad regime and, and, and these people? And you also talked about the uh, Russia and Iran relation, meaning that Iran wants, uh, knowing that Iwa Ir Iran, like you said that uh, both of you mentioned about like the Russian interest in a state, uh, a st stabilized state in Syria. And you said, talk, you talked about Assad being the uh, main factor of the stabilization. And the Iranians want different things, which is more parallel institutions, while the Russians want um, the state of Syria to flourish and strengthen. The Iranians want their parallel institutions to become stronger. That is the military institutions, the militias that they have built in Syria, and the economic and social gains that they have gained uh, via soft power initiatives, land purchases, demographic changes, cultural centers, religious initiatives. So meanwhile, the U.S. is mainly focused on the leverage of the reconstruction and some sanctions, like last week we also saw the sanctions of these colonies like Samir Foz. Do you think this is enough? What else can be done, and how do you see the U.S. policy evolving or not evolving in Syria? So I would like to to both both to try to answer these questions or around these questions, and then we'll take uh, people's people's questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anin. The, the, the way um, Assad is thinking uh, now, uh, in my view, he, he sticks. Uh, to his father's uh, textbook in a very systematic uh, way. Uh, 
That means that for him, uh, the core of what we call the state, I mean, I'm not sure they have the notion of what a state uh, uh, means, in fact, but, but the, the, the core of what we, we call the state is, once again, the uh, Morabarat plus the prison, uh, prison system, which is extremely important in his vision uh, of the country. And when, uh, I if he won, and I'm sure that he, he is very uh, satisfied, he believes that he has won, of course, he won because he has been able to reestablish uh, the rule of terror, the uh, rule of fear. It's a political victory more than a military victory or a territorial victory. And <laughs> Uh, the uh, you know economics has never mattered for him. Uh, when I was ambassador, uh, I remember a time uh, when uh, I tried to focus on uh, the development of the country, um, economic programs, uh, huge opportunities offered by the Iraqi market and things like that, uh, new zone with Turkey and so on. That was immaterial for the, uh, the key people in the system. For them, what matters is war and peace, not uh, economics. That, of course, in the same time, the same people are very keen uh, to uh, have their crony uh, friends uh, making as much as money as possible and uh, sending it to Dubai or, or elsewhere in, in, in Europe or in tax havens. But, you know, they care about their own business. They don't care about the economic development of the country. And so the, the basic premises that uh, there is something like uh, 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 leverage with reconstruction seems to me very uh, difficult to believe in. So his mindset is focused on uh, ruling the country as usual through uh, controlling the people uh, and, and then relying on, uh, on the uh, political, uh, po uh, various political policies. And for him, that's the heart of the, uh, of the system. Uh, in the same time, I think that uh, he probably uh, deems very important for him to reconquer the entire uh, territory of the country. And I have no doubt that uh, Idlib is the next uh, stage, the next, next step. Uh, it's very important precisely uh, to fill the gap in terms of legitimacy towards uh, the majority uh, of the country. Already they have lost uh, the Golan. And it means a lot, you know, in, in, in Syria, when you, when you live in Damascus or when you travel in, uh, in, in the country, inevitably, at some point, uh, Sunni uh, personalities would tell you, yes, we can live with Assad, this regime is not all that bad, so, but they lost the Golan. And they were not able to reconquer it, neither by um, uh, military means nor by negotiation. So it seems to me that it's impossible for Assad to uh, uh, see him staying in power with not only the Golan lost, but also uh, Idlib or the uh, uh, northeast uh, part of the, of the country. Now, on um, uh, Iran, Russia, Assad, the trio, as you said, is not a puppet, that, that's clear. That, that is to say that even uh, being extremely weak, uh, extremely dependent upon his, his sponsors, he will continue to uh, pretend that uh, he's, uh, he's a master of the game, uh, he wants to have things done the way he wants. And for instance, the link between my first point and, and the second point, if you look at the current situation, any uh, uh, dictatorship in his place 
would accept um, freeing some of the detainees. You know, that would make uh, the Russians happy. The Russians would be in a position to tell the West, you know, look, we, we've got something. Uh, for his own uh, power, there would be no risk. He would gain maybe a kind of popularity in some sectors uh, of the opinion, but no way for him. You know, the, the, the risk would be to diminish uh, the rule of, uh, of uh, fear and terror. Um, so that, that is the kind of uh, regime we have to, to deal with. And the Russians are certainly extremely powerful. They can get uh, more from him than they pretend they, they, they can. But ultimately, on those basic tenets of the system, it's true that probably they cannot uh, uh, influence very much uh, the way uh, Assad is doing things. And of course, there is a, com a real competition between Iran and, and Russia in that respect. And in that respect, uh, Iran is able to side with, with Assad, to support uh, Assad. The, the larger question, uh, it seems to me that uh, Russia and Iran are in an uh, alliance of convenience. It's not out of uh, sympathy, but uh, out of um, common interest. Uh, I, I, I cannot pretend I understand uh, very well the Syrians, but I had a, a long history with, with Russia. I've served uh, myself four years in, in Russia. And I, it seems to me that uh, <coughs> the, the Russian leadership uh, tend to manage uh, statu quo such as, it, such as it is. That is to say, Putin himself is able to take bold decisions from time to time, but in between, uh, he's very, very cautious, in fact. And the thing is that, for the time being, uh, Russia depends upon Shia militias to keep some order in the country. So it will be very difficult for them to sacrifice this uh, important uh, current outcome of their alliance with, with Iran. So maybe they could disagree of the future of Syria. They certainly disagree about Israel. But the, 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 the Russian leadership doesn't focus about the future. They focus on managing the, the, the current situation. And the last time I uh, went to, to Moscow, uh, I had a discussion with a very good expert, because they are very knowledgeable uh, people, who was telling me there are two major risks for Russia in the, the situation in, uh, in, uh, in Syria regarding uh, Iran. First, the risk of escalation between uh, uh, Israel and Iran. And secondly, a risk of deep penetration by Iran of the fabric of the Syrian society. Mm. Unfortunately, this second risk, the leadership simply is not interesting in dealing with that. They think that it's too much uh, hypothetical. And the first risk, uh, escalation between uh, Israel and Iran, they take that seriously, of course, uh, uh, Putin. But he has a kind of uh, strategy. He has a solution for that. The solution is the agreement with uh, Netanyahu. Mm. And so the free hand, which is given uh, to Israel to do whatever he wants to stop Iranian uh, um, expansionism in, uh, in military terms in, uh, in Syria, that for the military um, pillar, and there is the political pillar, which is this idea that uh, Ambassador Ford mentioned, that they will rebuild the national army. I'm very skeptical about that. Uh, and uh, by having, again, a strong national army, the regime uh, will not depend uh, anymore upon the Shia militias and uh, upon Iran. The trouble is that the Iranians are not stupid. They understand that also. 
and they will be also very active in rebuilding the uh, national uh, army in Syria. And they will make sure that uh, next, uh, the, the future army will be controlled both by Russia and by uh, Iran. And in the same time, how do you uh, rebuild a national army when you have no conscripts? Because the reality is that uh, the young people in, in Syria, uh, they don't want to join the army. They, they go abroad if, uh, if they can't escape uh, conscription. So it's very, very hard to figure out uh, how uh, the uh, Putin's plan, if I may say so, uh, will work in the long run. That means that, like uh, as Ambassador uh, uh, Ford, uh, I would caution uh, against uh, big expectations of the next uh, meeting. Uh, probably the, the Russians will try to sell the idea that uh, the US should no renormalize with the regime against a promise that in the future they will deal with Iran. But in the immediate situation, I don't see how they can really um, uh, do something against the Iranian influence in in uh, in Syria, except once again by offering the the Israeli uh, the possibility to do the job themselves. Mm -hmm. So the, we are in a kind of a catch 22, 20 uh, situation twenty two situation uh, in which I don't really see a way out. Thank you, Ambassador Ford. A few quick remarks about uh, how the Assad government views the future of Syrian society and reconciliation, uh, the question you asked, Tanid. Um, I didn't hear Bashar in 2017 refer to marginalized populations. Um, he's not that dumb, but that's certainly what he's, where he's going. Um, in a sense, what he's talking about is um, a more loyal country where the opposition is uh, wiped out. Uh, perhaps some kind of token opposition is allowed. That was true even in 2011. Um, but for example, what we see in Idlib is the government trying to stamp out um, opposition. Um, they're not making much progress, which I think is indicative of the manpower shortages that uh, Ambassador Duclos was just talking about. Uh, but in any case, um, the vision is one where um, loyal business people work with loyal local communities um, under the purview of the central government in Damascus. Um, the Russians, the Americans, lots of people have talked about decentralization. The Syrian state has no experience with that. Um, and I don't think they will be giving much genuine authority to local communities to make decisions. Um, and aside here, I was in Iraq uh, 10 years ago when we were constantly trying to get the Iraqis to decentralize. And even Iraqis of goodwill, um, who were limited in number, but even the Iraqis of goodwill with respect to that idea found huge difficulties in implementing it. It's not as easy as it, as it sounds um, or as it looks when you're writing an essay about it. Uh, so the vision is uh, places like Idlib, East Aleppo, uh, Dada who, who resist, they are crushed. Uh, there are no funds to rebuild them. Uh, refugees don't have places to go home to, and they're not welcome anyway. Um, areas where there are reconciliation agreements, for the most part, uh, the government cleanses them gradually, not the next day, not the second day after the agreement is signed, but weeks and months later, people disappear. Lots of stories about that now. Uh, it's interesting that it seems that the one place where uh, genuine opposition people still have a small measure of safety are the places where the Russian military police predominate and not the Syrian intelligence services. But 
Those are relatively small. Um, they certainly don't represent the majority of the territory under regime control. And so uh, the future of Western Syria, where the government predominates, um, is pretty grim. Uh, not much reconstruction. Uh, a few areas where crony business people are um, developing residential commercial areas, um, but these are limited in size. Um, few people get rich. Um, and in the meantime, the Syrian middle class, which I think was an achievement of the of the government up until 2011, the Syrian middle class uh, is simply uh, destroyed. It's probably in many ways already destroyed. Um, but uh, sanctions and uh, constant currency devaluations uh, will impoverish it. We saw the same thing in Iraq uh, 20 years ago. So that leads me then to your second question about uh, the American strategy. And the American strategy is best I understand it. Um, and I live happily in New England, far from Washington. But uh, the way it looks to me is that the Americans are trying to strangle uh, Syria, also strangle Iran, uh, but strangle Syria economically. Uh, heavy duty sanctions, um, the American step uh, to make it more difficult for uh, commercial oil tankers to call on Syria um, by uh, going after the insurance companies. Um, that was not something we thought of in the Obama administration. I think it's ingenious. Um, and it has certainly caused fuel shortages. We saw press stories about that um, earlier in the spring, uh, but it didn't bring down the outside government. And I think um, as Ambassador Duclos just said, fundamentally, Assad doesn't really care much about the economic well-being of his people. Um, he's interested in power um, for himself, his family, um, and his uh, his ruling clique, as it were. Um, so I don't think economic sanctions and denying reconstruction aid, hindering World Bank uh, financing or uh, delaying European efforts to uh, finance reconstruction here and there, I don't think any of that is going to deliver significant political concessions out of uh, the Assad government. Instead, I think what you'll see is they will look for workarounds, um, devious workarounds, um, with China, with India, um, with other countries that don't respect uh, the American push on sanctions. As I said, reconstruction is not going to happen in large parts of Syria. It's one of the reasons refugees um, won't have much to go home to. It's a pretty depressing picture. Um, your last question is, well, are there other things Washington can do? And here I'm going to say something that's controversial. Um, what the heck? I don't think America can control the future of Syria. I want to say that again. America cannot control the future of Syria. It was a war. Um, military might matters in war. Uh, during the Obama administration, we constantly repeated there is no military solution. Um, largely, we were wrong. Uh, there was. And if Assad hasn't recaptured all of the country yet, um, there is no doubt in my mind that he will continue to try to do so, just as Ambassador Duclo mentioned. Um, the one thing that surprises me in all of this is that Assad hasn't outplayed us in eastern Syria. And this is what I mean by that. Um, it would not have been so hard for the Syrian government, working with Russian mediators, to cut a deal with the uh, PYD, the uh, Syrian Kurdish political leadership, which in turn um, broadly oversees the uh, Syrian Kurdish YPG militia. I'm, I'm a little surprised that Assad didn't make some promises, just as he made promises uh, to opposition uh, leaders in some of the uh, restive communities in Western Syria in 2017. 2018. Um, but he hasn't made promises like that uh, to the Syrian Kurds and thereby has actually made it easier um, for the Americans to try to hold the Syrian Kurds out of Assad's orbit so far. Um, not exactly what the Russian plan was. And uh, 
we're lucky in that sense that Assad has overplayed his hand, but I wouldn't assume that that will last forever. Um, and in a sense, this idea that the Americans have a lot of leverage by holding eastern Syria, you'd have to believe that Assad cares about economics uh, more than politics. I don't think he does. Um, you'd have to believe that uh, the Americans are immune to uh, potential casualty figures. I don't think they are. Um, I don't think most of uh, the American public really understands what the Americans are doing in eastern Syria. And as light is shown on it, uh, it's going to be a little hard to explain what the fundamental American mission in eastern Syria is. Is it to fight ISIS? Or is it to help promote a Kurdish autonomous district in northeastern Syria? Uh, or is it to resist uh, Iranian encroachment into eastern Syria? Um, there's been a lot of mission creep in that American uh, policy out in eastern Syria. And the Trump administration, best I can tell, is doing nothing uh, to sharpen the focus. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, both of you, for your great answers. Um, I would like to take some questions now. Uh, yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this can event. You, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, my name is Andres Nicolaitis. I'm the DCM at the Embassy of Cyprus. And I have two questions. Uh, um, the first one, uh, it refers to Ambassador Duclos, uh, and also um, given that uh, the Assad regime is in a better position now than it was two, three years ago, what should, should you suggest that the European approach should be towards, uh, towards that regime? Uh, if we should continue with diplomatic and economic isolation, but what would be the down the line in five years' time, in ten years' time? And my other question is for Ambassador uh, Ford. And with regard to the fact that the meeting between the uh, national security advisors of the U.S., Israel, and Russia is taking place, and that's a message in and of itself, um, would you suggest that, uh, would it be realistic to pursue a policy of trying to drive a wedge between the Russians and the Iranians in Syria? Uh, because, okay, it's an alliance of convenience, but uh, isn't it mutually the one that needs the other in some ways? Let's take the second question and then, uh, yeah, please. We'll take two questions and then we give you a chance to answer and then we move on. Thank you very much. My name is Hossam Bagas. I'm a Fulbright Scholar at uh, Cedar Hall University and also I'm intern at Al Jazeera Arabic. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First to uh, ex uh, your Ambassador Nicolo is, is really uh, ISIS, is ISIS really defeated or is it uh, just regrouping? Second question is to Ambassador Ford is, how will Syria recover economically and how will the international community reconcile uh, its uh, distaste to, um, towards uh, Bashar al-Assad with the need to help the people, as you mentioned before? Thank you. Okay. The, the first question about uh, what uh, should Europe do, uh, I have a very provocative answer and something which is extremely difficult when you are an official to suggest to your government is simply wait and see. And of course, it's horrible because the situation of the people in the country is so bad that uh, uh, for simply humanitarian uh, reasons or out of sympathy, you want to do something for them and try to find a way uh, to bring uh, some humanitarian help or to help what we call uh, uh, stabilization programs. But my recommendations, my recommendation would be to uh, deploy your efforts in that field in favor of the Syrians abroad, those who are refugees uh, elsewhere, or in the part of uh, Syria, 
which is more or less under our control, says the um, Northeast. But we should refrain from taking initiatives, other initiatives, <laughs> political initiatives, when, as, as Ambassador Ford said, the name of the game for the time being is still uh, the time of military option. Wait and see is a very difficult policy uh, to follow, as uh, everybody knows. On your second question, uh, ISIS, um, seen from France, it's very clear that uh, ISIS is still there, that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, sleeping cells, that the ideology has penetrated uh, large uh, part of the uh, opinion. Uh, you have, uh, you still have a lot of uh, young fighters who have the rage to 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 fight. So everything is in place for a future renewal of a terrorist uh, threat, and that is a, a major difference, I think, with um, with this country. Uh, in France, nobody challenged the idea that we should stay in the northeast of, uh, of Syria precisely for this reason, as a way to make sure that um, the uh, jihadist uh, uh, threat is a bit under control. And I must say that uh, in, my, in my book, I have uh, some considerations about uh, the use of force, uh, the debate about the legitimacy of use of force, and so on. And we in the West, uh, we drew from uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Libya, and other uh, situations like that, uh, the conclusion that uh, we have to avoid as much as possible any uh, new uh, military intervention. But when you look at the Syrian case, you can also come to another conclusion, which is if you don't use force at uh, time t, you will have to use it at time t plus two or three. Uh, maybe in worse conditions that if you had uh, moved in t1. We, we didn't intervene in uh, 2013, that was one of the root causes of the rise of Daesh, and ultimately we had to go there to crush Daesh in very bad conditions indeed. So I, I'm not, you know, uh, of course, a uh, 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 warmonger, I'm not saying that we should send uh, troops uh, everywhere, and that's, that's not at all uh, in the game, of course. But keeping some military imprint uh, in the Northeast, I think it means uh, a lot of sense. Thank you. Ambassador Ford. Um, with respect to the question about America, American policy and trying to drive a wedge between Russia and Iran, the question from our diplomatic colleague from Cyprus. Um, I think fool's errand. Um, as I mentioned, uh, since 2012, I can remember U.S. Uh, policy discussions about how to get the Russians to uh, step up pressure against Iran, and I don't think we've been terribly successful so far. Here's the fundamental policy issue. The Russians and the Iranians share an interest in reducing American influence in the and in the Middle East in general. They may argue about tactics. Occasionally, they might even argue about a strategy. But their fundamental shared interest is to reduce American influence in that part of the world. And so I think it's highly unlikely that the Russians are going to try to diminish Iranian influence so that American influence can grow. I, that just strikes me as uh, wishful thinking at best. And here's 
here's a way to think about it tactically. Um, if the Russians were successful and, and broadly diminished Iranian influence, um, Ambassador Duclos mentioned how important the Iranian-backed militias are to the stability of the Syrian state. He's absolutely right, of course. Uh, but uh, suppose that the Russians put forward that they were willing to, to risk that, they would then turn around and say to the United States, but you need yourselves then to re-engage with the Syrian state and to provide resources, especially as the Iranian resources going into Syria diminish. I, I live in New England, as I mentioned, but I think those of you in Washington would probably agree with me that it's highly unlikely that this American Congress is going to forward uh, large amounts of development assistance, reconstruction assistance, to the parts of Syria that are under the control of Bashar al-Assad. I just, it's just unimaginable to me. So uh, I, I just don't think there's, there's going to be a lot to be uh, gained trying and depending on uh, driving a wedge between Russia and Iran. You might get a tactical success here or there, but it's not going to amount to very much in the strategic picture. Um, to the uh, the young man, uh, the Fulbright scholar um, affiliated with Al Jazeera and reconciliation, I I have to say, I just don't think there's going to be um, genuine reconciliation in Syria. There's going to be a security state um, which uh, rules much as it did, um, and will try to intimidate. That is the key word, intimidate. Uh, potential op opponents of the government into uh, silence and obedience. Um, I don't see any genuine uh, interest on the part of the authorities in Damascus about reconciliation. I see much more interest on their parts about intimidation. I'm going to stop there. Uh, Ambassador, you wanted to say something about that? Yes, if I may elaborate a little bit on the uh, Iranian-Russian um, uh, uh, alliance. Um, it seems to me that uh, a key factor is Israel itself. That is to say, um, we probably would be in a better position uh, to drive a, a wedge between the Iranians and uh, the Russians if basically the Israeli did not share the same uh, um, faith in keeping Assad. And you have a, a, a paradox in uh, Moscow, uh, Tehran, and uh, Jerusalem disagreeing on a lot of things, except one thing, which is to keep Assad. And there, uh, I'm not familiar myself with the uh, Israeli thinking, but I'm always a bit puzzled when I discuss with uh, Israeli colleagues that they seem not to realize that the devil they know, as they say, is not anymore the devil they knew. And they probably... Uh, in, indulge like uh, of all of us in some wishful thinking, which is that at some point Assad will uh, turn completely in the Russian uh, camp against uh, the uh, Iranian camp, but precisely Assad will never do that. Mm. He's much too dependent upon the Iranians and he doesn't want to be in a position to be dependent upon only the Russians, of course. His interest is to have at least two sponsors. And uh, apparently, uh, our Israeli, uh, Israeli uh, colleagues uh, do not see uh, that um, uh, for Iran, Assad is extremely important. Because the Iranians are very unpopular in Syria. They are not accepted, of course, by the Sunni, but they are also very unpopular in the Alawi community. And so Assad is the only entry point for them. So I think that if we are serious about uh, reducing drastically Iranian influence uh, in Syria, we should reconsider this question of the, which used to be called the, the Assad's fate. Thank you very much. That is very 
very important. Um, we can take, I think, two more questions, please. Hi, uh, Moti Kahana. I think I'm one of the few American Israeli which helping in Syria in the last eight years. Uh, I'm going to make a comment to both ambassador because I think next week meeting in Israel, it's all about Bibi is talking to his base, how wonderful I am, and it has nothing to do with Iran because he forgot to invite the Iranian to Jerusalem. If Bibi invite the Iranian, exactly, the soon as Bibi invite the Iranian, <coughs> maybe he can actually talk about the Iranian in Syria. They're not going anywhere. But I'm going to ask both of you guys about Eastern Syria or Java and Turkey. Uh, how, uh, two questions to Ambassador Ford, uh, do you think the American will leave Syria? And if they will, is the France planning to replace uh, the French government, say they're not going to leave? Uh, and then to do with Idlib, how Turkey will react if Assad continue moving into Idlib? And what if that's going to be a compromise? Assad, okay, you can take Idlib, we will take Kurdish area, Turkey. That's a question to both of you. Last question. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Kurzig, uh, who retired from USDA. My question may have been answered in the last couple of comments that were made. But since we're talking about U.S. policy in the region, is it an effective policy, in fact, to sanction Iran and therefore to reduce and substantially the amount of funding that's going to Syria. I know that Hezbollah has been weakened in Lebanon, Hamas has been weakened, according to my brother who lives next door to Hamas, has been weakened in, in, uh, in uh, Gaza. So is that really an effective policy? And is that a U.S. policy, is basically to weaken Iran enough that it will have an impact on Syria? Thank you very much. Thank you. We have 10 more minutes, Max, so uh, we can both answer these questions briefly so we can conclude. Um, the the, um, the the Turkish uh, uh, issue uh, with the Kurds and uh, and so on. Uh, my personal inclination would be to say uh, it's very important to find uh, any kind of agreement with the with with, with Turkey. I mean, we lost. We lost uh, CIA, it's very bad, and uh, sp especially for the, the French people uh, from a historical and, and, and sentimental perspective. But if we were to lose Turkey, it would have, of course, immense strategic implications. So uh, we have to be loyal to the, the Kurds, but we have to negotiate with them to bring them to a uh, position where they would stop to be perceived as a threat by the uh, Turkish uh, state. I know that it's extremely difficult that the uh, Turks are paranoid about uh, uh, Kurds, but I don't see an other, uh, an alternative uh, path to solving this uh, very difficult uh, problem. If the uh, Americans withdraw, we will lose any opportunity to do that. And of course, there will be no French or British uh, military troops uh, to replace the Americans who are in together, out together. It's very clear for us. We feel with that we are very important people, but we are realistic. And there are things that we cannot do uh, alone. And the second issue, Idlib, uh, it's quite possible that uh, uh, at some point uh, Putin and Erdogan agree on something, that is to say that uh, the Turks would close their eyes uh, to a major offensive by the regime supported by, uh, by Russia in exchange of a free end in some part of the country where the, the Kurds uh, are still in control in the part where, uh, where they are not supported by, uh, by the West, of course. It's, it's a distinct uh, uh, possibility. Uh, it seems to me that it, we are making a collective mistake by not highlighting the stakes in Idlib, where you had 
uh, uh, civilian population able to uh, demonstrate both against the regime and against uh, Al-Qaeda in uh, uh, towns like uh, um, Marat al-Noman or Kafranwell. And, and, and so it, it's really a shame that we are not in a position to support those people. Instead of that, we are accepting that the civilian population is not protected against uh, indiscriminate uh, bombing. You know, and what we should do uh, uh, should be a combination of very bold steps, both to support the civilian population, to protest against uh, what the Russians and the um, uh, Syrians are doing, and also maybe to have some positive incentives uh, towards the Russians, because by the way, in Idlib, we have also a common enemy with uh, the remnants of uh, Al-Qaeda. Thank you. Ambassador Ford, you have the last word. <laughs> There's a frightening thought. Um, well, with respect to the uh, American deployment in eastern Syria, I predicted in the media more than a year ago that the Americans would eventually withdraw. I still think they will. I think the president's inclination is very obvious. Uh, the State Department and the Defense Department clawed their, uh, their way back to keeping a small residual presence, a few hundred soldiers in a ton and up in uh, northeastern Syria. Uh, it's not clear to me that they're going to be able uh, by themselves do very much. I suppose if European countries like France were to uh, deploy forces permanently along with the Americans, that would perhaps produce a little more, but fundamentally the, the deep social issues which created support for the uprising in 2011 and 2012, and later created support among broad segments of the population in Eastern Syria for ISIS, um, those aren't addressed yet. And um, the, uh, there are a lot of people that overplay their hands in Syria. I mentioned Assad overplaying his hand. Um, another group that overplays their hand quite a bit are the PYD and the, the YPG militia. And they've managed to create a fair amount of resentment um, in some of the Arab areas down in Deir Ezzor and up in Hasakai. So um, I don't see that the, the Americans are going to be able by themselves to stabilize Eastern Syria. And I, I doubt very much that there's public support to pour in a lot more American resources and whether or not the Saudis are willing to, to finance that indefinitely, I think is also highly problematic, especially where American troops eventually to withdraw. So um, my advice to the Syrian Kurds has always been cut your best deal now with the Assad government while you can. I'm going to stop there, Anine. And with that, let me ask everyone give a very warm uh, thanks to our speakers today. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Hanin.